Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Artisanal Mining Ground Challenge webinar. Um, today, we're going to be talking about one of the sub challenge in this competition, the Global Data Sub Challenge. Um, this is the sub challenge that is looking for solutions that are on site and downstream from ASM sites. Um, we have three uh, very um, excellent panelists joining us today to address your questions regarding the data sub challenge. I'm going to go through a couple of slides first and just a little bit of um, a little bit of background or information on how this webinar is going to work. Um, as uh, attendees in the webinar, you can type in your questions. There is a QA box um, in the Zoom webinar, and there's also a chat box. Um, if you can, try to type your questions into the QA box. We'll also be monitoring the chat one, um, but it's nice if all the questions come into one location. Um, we will, um, uh, myself and my colleague Amy, will moderate the questions and um, address them to the panelists uh, as they come up. If we don't get to all of your questions in this session, we will um, try to address them afterwards through our frequently asked questions on the website um, or you know, through uh, a newsletter. Um, Again, we, we, we have an hour. We'll try to get to all your questions. I also have some prepared questions for the panelists as well. So first of all, um, welcome again. And uh, I wanted to go through a couple of these slides on the um, global data uh, sub-challenge. So this sub-challenge is really trying to address uh, those data needs, the data gaps that um, are going to measure the environmental and social impacts of ASM, but also um, how can those how can these data uh, address the um, or really equip the people with the tools um, to make the right decisions to improve the environmental and social outcomes of ASM practices? So within this sub challenge, it might be mechanisms to collect data, to analyze data, process data. Uh, visualize and share data. Um, it also might be tools to help collect um, the information as well. Um, in addition, I also want to point out that we do have the Microsoft AI for Earth Award. This is um, an award that's available to innovations across all three of the sub-challenge categories. It's not just applicable to the global data sub-challenge. And if you're interested in hearing more about um, how to apply, we, have a, we had another webinar uh, that we recorded last week, and um, I can share that information with you if, if you write to me and ask for it. It's also available on our website. Um, you can watch that whole recording on how to apply to the Artisanal Mining Grand Challenge. So a bit about our panelists. We have three um, distinguished panelists here. We have uh, Dominique Bali. He is the president of the um, African Center for Environmental Health, uh, based in Cote d'Ivoire, um, and a number of years of experience regarding environmental health and sciences, um, particularly in mercury contamination uh, related to artisanal and small-scale gold mining. Um, we have, and I'll allow each of you to give, um, to give a little more background on um, uh, after, after I'm done with my brief introductions. And we also have uh, James McQuilkin. He is currently a program officer of PACT, at PACT. Um, he's also instrumental in writing the uh, DELVE's um, state of the sector report on um, data gaps and data needs regarding artisanal and small scale mining. Um, it's really small font, but you, I included the link to the DELVE database platform um, and in, his, uh, in the description. Um, we also have uh, Luis Fernandez. He is the executive director of the Center for Amazonian Scientific Innovation, uh, the acronym of CINCIA. A number of years of experience regarding artisanal scale gold mining, um, especially in South America. And um, each of these panelists uh, can really, you know, I'd really like them to dig into um, what are those, those data gaps? How can this grand challenge address those data gaps? Um, what information do we need to know in order to make this sector more responsible, in order to make it formalized? Um, what is it going to take to get there? And we're hoping that through this competition, we can inspire and incentivize innovation um, to address these, 
these data gaps and data needs. So with that, um, I'm going to ask each panelist to again give just a little bit of background on um, what you have, what you're currently working on, and um, briefly state um, what are those greatest data gaps uh, in your opinion? Um, what do you hope to see come through the competition uh, innovation-wise? So, um, uh, Luis, I'm going to start with you. There you go. You're off mute. Good morning, everyone. Uh, at least good morning from uh, San Francisco. Um, I'm Luis Fernandez, and I have worked in la artisanal and small-scale gold mining for uh, about 15 years, uh, mainly in South America and in Africa. Um, one thing that uh, we have seen over and over again is that there are lots of opportunities for improving the quality of data for artisanal mining, uh, not just in gold, but for most metals and gemstones. Uh, we work in mainly in uh, places that have experienced uh, large-scale environmental degradation. So currently, we work in Madre de Dios uh, in southern Peru, where there has been, uh, over the last 15 years, uh, about 150,000 hectares uh, degraded by mining uh, because of a large uh, boom. Uh, most of the mining has been unfortunately illegal, but there is some informal mining. Uh, and there's a, a sense that there has to be a lot of uh, action to try to either stop the mining or to formalize the mining uh, in a way to reduce the impact. Of course, there's a lot of opportunities uh, for fixing the problems. This is an area that is um, Amazon forest, extremely biodiverse, and it's a uh, uh, there's a fair amount of information that indicates that there's large-scale mercury contamination. Of course, every case is different, uh, but uh, one fact that we see over and over again is that there's limited information about uh, not only what's going on, uh, but also the issue of uh, information for miners and how to improve uh, their production. Uh, the impacts that the mining is causing, the feedback to policymakers and to the miners themselves. Sometimes the activity is very disconnected uh, by uh, the impacts that are occurring. Um, the information uh, on these impacts on the general public, many times people downstream uh, or in the surrounding areas are unaware of the health impacts or of the environmental damage that's being uh, occurred. So much of, much of the time, especially since this is done in very remote areas, this information is not provided. Um, and also the information uh, on the ground, kind of in the mining zone, doesn't really move up into decision makers or specialists in, in the capital cities or outside the country, except for extremely negative information. Basically, uh, when things have gone horribly wrong and huge uh, hundreds of thousands of hectares are destroyed and or hundreds or thousands of people are affected, then you have information, but usually it's just a description of the problems and not a description of the solutions. So um, I'll leave it there um, and we can talk about more some of the specific uh, data gaps and opportunities, but I kind of wanted to just open up saying that uh, inherently, you know, we can think about ASM uh, as, uh, you know, needing to fix machines or have a better system or uh, better detectors. But a lot of it really has to do with data. Uh, the information getting to some place that has a uh, reaction that feeds back to other people. Much of this uh, has been shown in other, uh, in other systems to work once you create a, a flow of information that's verified. Um, of course, this is uh, key for uh, economies and markets. So I hope to talk more about this during this one. Thanks, Luis. Um, Dominique, why don't you give us um, a bit more information on your background and um, highlight some of those areas that, that you've seen in your experience that could really use um, more data, uh, techniques to gather that data, and um, 
how best to get that data into the, the right hands to make the best decisions. Thank you so much, Barbara. Good evening from West Africa, where I'm based now. And I have been working on chemicals issues as chemical engineer for long years. And since uh, 20, 10 years ago, we have been started our work on ASGM, especially on mercury issues and even on dental mercury issues. And that work on ASGM was initially based on collecting data to prove to have a proven evidence of mercury pollution of the environment. This is what we have been doing in several African countries, started by my country, Cote d'Ivoire, and then Burkina Faso, Mali, and Guinea, Senegal, and then Niger, Ghana. And based on that, we have been continuing our work on assisting countries in addressing the gaps in data collection for mercury inventories and other ESGM related issues inventories. And until that, we have been continuing assisting countries now in at African level for implementation of the Minamata Convention, especially the different articles related to the development of national action plans for mercury reduction and even mercury elimination in ESGM sector. And since then, we have been conducted several studies in countries across the continent where we're able to assist countries in develop this plan. And this is what we are still doing. Our last project, the National Action Plan for Mercury Reduction to be developed in Guinea and Niger. So we complete, we just completed the one of Guinea and we are still working with Niger to complete the NAP development. So our work for, our work is to assist in how, to assist countries, but also assist the scientific communities with safe and sound data so that they can help them to map mercury pollution. It, they will be easier, it will be easy also for them to design the different plans in taking into account environmental issues that will be uh, that will save for the environmental protection of the population this is probably what we are doing now in Cote d'Ivoire and even across the continent for this our role could be in assisting the global challenge with the safe data, especially safe data on mercury. Uh, we, can, we can assist in developing different tools which will save the countries to, to map the pollution, to map the, to address the environmental gaps necessary to, they, they need to, to, to match in order to comply with Minamata Con to comply with Minamata Convention provisions, especially the one related to Article 7, which is in charge of SGM issues. We'll have time to discuss more during that webinar, and I think I will give more information and more details on what is needed in terms of information or strategies to, to address this kind of gaps. Thank you. Thanks, Dominic. Um, James, let's, uh, let's hear from you. Um, a bit about your background and uh, those um, data gaps, the areas that you see uh, can really use an infusion of innovation um, that we might be able to um, incentivize through this competition. And um, also, you know, this is a great opportunity to talk about the Delve platform and um, the report that, that you guys published um, last year. Brilliant, thank you, Barbara, and good evening, everyone. Um, from Kigali, Rwanda, um, and thanks for organizing. Um, yeah, so my name's James McCorkin. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a, PAC, I'm a program officer uh, at PACT in the Mines Markets team. And in terms of my actual personal background, um, yeah, I've been doing kind of international development project coordinating and, and management on a variety of projects. And also um, in, well, 2018, I completed my, my PhD, uh, which focused on mapping artisanal small scale gold and mining communities in, in Ghana. Uh, and yeah, looking at some of the, these, these yeah, communities in detail 
in order to provide a bit of recommendations around certification initiatives. And a lot of it was actually saying, you know, we need this rich uh, community and mindsight level data uh, to actually, yeah, build a case for supporting and formalizing and addressing some of these issues within, within these communities. Um, in terms of my role at PACT, as mentioned, I've been working on the Delve initiative, um, which is an initiative between the World Bank and PACT. And really it's to develop a, a global platform for artisanal small scale mining data. Um, and the idea came about um, three or four years ago now. Um, and really it was around changing the narrative on, on the ASM sector. Uh, you know, to go from, from this idea that, that many people hold, uh, when I say people, I guess I mean more, more public, that, it, that the sector's dirty and chaotic and, and really to, to try and create more of a shared knowledge base that, that really demonstrates its development uh, potential socially and economically. Uh, and yeah, not, not, not shying away either from the environmental impacts, but like uh, Louise and Dominique have kind of highlighted, you know, finding solutions to address those. Um, and in terms of the, the, the platform that itself, which you can find online, and thanks for sharing that link, um, there's, there's three main components. There's a database which uh, combines, which has uh, data points. Um, and to actually create that, and we'll get a bit more into this later, you know, a lot of time was spent going through reports and publications to find uh, different statistics to actually tease them out and essentially put them into a, a pivot table um, and, and create, you know, an Excel file. And um, so that's that database. And we're, we're it's an open data platform, Delve, so we're continuously looking for contributions and, and to build this shared knowledge base for the sector. The second part of it is a library of resources, a searchable library um, of, of all kinds of different publications on the sector. And the third bit is a, is a directory of, uh, of experts. So, you know, everyone on this call, everyone uh, within the ASM sector, policymakers to communities can go and create a profile and, and hopefully, you know, uh, network with one another. Um, and like I mentioned, it's an, it's an open source database. So, yeah, you're, you're able to upload and submit your own data contributions and uh, to that database. Um, when it comes to the, the data gaps, and, and thanks, Barbara, uh, for highlighting that, um, uh, the report. So, um, each year, starting in 2019, uh, April, which is when we formally launched the, the platform, uh, we have this uh, state of the sector report. Um, and really the, the main aim of that report is to kind of provide expert analysis and insights, uh, showcase some of those new data contributions, identify these data gaps like we're discussing today, and provide a bit of a call to action. And uh, within the 2019 report, as it was the first one, um, we kind of outlined this need for, for this data. And, and on page 73 towards the end, um, we highlight a range of different types of data. Um, and the, uh, the main ones that really stand out um, just briefly are, are employment, uh, disaggregated by gender, um, production, um, revenue, and even to some extent geological data um, in order to, to unlock uh, finance, you know, and show what's in the ground uh, in order for small, uh, for small scale miners. And yeah, I mean, um, the main, the main reason to address these data gaps is, is going back to the original aim of Delve, which is to change the narrative, uh, demonstrate you know, just how important uh, the, the sector is to uh, national economies, uh, and at the end of the day, yeah, encourage policymakers to, to address some of these issues and uh, show the economic value as well as the social uh, value of doing so. Um, yeah, I think that, that sums it up well, and I just noted a, a chat there. So the, the platform, uh, D E L V E, uh, you know, beginning with the idea of delving into data. Um, so yeah, I'll pause there and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, James. Um, since we are, uh, since since I have you um, on the screen here, um, can you tell us um, a little, give a little more information on these these data gaps and, and how you got all of this information. So, um, you know, you, you had to dig through published and unpublished um, documents and reports in order to create the Delve report. Um, so I'm wondering if you see an opportunity there. Um, you know, what I've heard in speaking with people, there's, there's a lot of information out there. It's just not accessible. Um, so how might we, um, how might we apply some innovative um, mechanisms or solutions, you know, how might we uh, get at more of this information that is perhaps published, but, but hidden, hidden away in gray literature or perhaps in the cabinets of um, 
<laughs> offices uh, around the world. <laughs> No, brilliant question. Thank you. Um, yeah, exactly. So, so in the report, we kind of say that the need for better access to complete, accurate and reliable data, and it's all about that accessibility. Um, so yeah, in terms of um, building the, the database uh, that sits behind the Dell platform and then into the report, I often describe it as a, as a kind of rabbit going down the rabbit hole. So for example, say you want to find the employment estimate for the number of small scale miners in, in Ghana. Uh, and you find a report that's got a 2019, you know, was published in 2019, and it says there's one million miners. Now you go to the report itself, and you find the reference, and maybe it's referencing another uh, report from, let's say, 2015. Uh, you head to that uh, reference, uh, that document, and you find it's referencing another report. And sometimes you go back all the way to some of these bigger publications um, and, and baselines that have been done at throughout maybe 30, 40 years ago, uh, perhaps like the ILO study um, in 1999. So what you find is you've got a figure for employment of the number of small scale miners, say in Ghana, that looks like it's from 2019, but actually is based on another, you know, 20 odd years ago. So these are some huge data gaps that we need to address because if we don't know exactly how many people are working in the sector, you know, we, we can't, I guess, understand their contribution to the economy. We can't understand how big the, the, the issue is as well as the, the, the potential to address, uh, address it too. Um, so yeah, this is one of the, 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 the significant data gaps. Um, so in terms of addressing it, like I said, it's actually a team of, I wasn't involved in Dell then, so it's really hats off to some of my colleagues who were um, just manually going through, uh, creating this very complicated uh, Excel sheet. Um, so yeah, some, some ideas around that, uh, and certainly we've discussed before within, within the Dell team at the World Bank Impact is machine learning or some kind of AI that could automatically, uh, you know, scan documents, pick out these, these figures, put them in a table, and then you know, enable a human then to, to go through and, and, and actually uh, analyze them and perhaps see how some of these numbers link back and then really understand uh, what credible numbers we, we do have. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, a great example here of, of, of something that it'd be great to see as one of the applications. Great, thank you. Um, a question perhaps for uh, Luis and, um, and Dominique on um, mercury pollution um, in the environment. So um, both of you mentioned uh, you know, current efforts or, or gaps in the information as to um, the, the extent of mercury contamination in the environment and perhaps um, efforts to map this, uh, map the pollution. Um, and it's not only um, mapping the pollution, but perhaps the um, uh, information on how it's affecting um, humans and communities um, and, and wildlife. And so I'm going to turn to, um, to both of you to tell us about what is available and then what, you know, what, what more do we need um, regarding our understanding of, of uh, mercury in the environment. Luis, do you want to go first? Okay. Question. Uh, so the uh, the issue of mercury is uh, is not very well known uh, for people on the ground, uh, especially those that are even doing the activity. Uh, mercury is important uh, for artisanal miners because it allows them to to capture small gold flecks in the sediments or the crushed rock that they process. Uh, but it has. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, negative aspects to it. It's a, it's a powerful neurotoxin. It affects the miners and it contaminates the environment. Um, it's very well documented since the 50s, creating Minamata disease and, and contamination of entire watersheds and, uh, and food supply that it affects fish. So uh, the, the issue really, as we mentioned before, is the question of getting that information and, and producing the data. So there's lots of aspects of this from a data perspective. So one is, how do you develop the data? Um, at CINCIA, and CINCIA is the Center for Scientific Innovation uh, in Amazonia, basically uh, a, a research center in the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, the center was actually formed uh, through a partnership between Wake Forest University and USAID. Um, and there was a data gap. The information didn't exist. People didn't know what the levels of mercury were. Uh, and they didn't know what the problems related to mercury were from a health perspective. So we created a mercury laboratory. It was one of the, the fastest ways that we had, could think of, of 
creating the scientific information. Uh, there was a data gap as well in terms of uh, the ability to generate this data. So uh, we set up a full Mercury lab with analytical chemists to start to analyze um, the materials that were in and around the mine, soils, water, fish, fruits, uh, you have it, you name it, uh, and then provide that information in a way that's consumable by a number of audiences, the public, um, decision makers, the miners themselves, children through education, and then also start to map it. So uh, instead of just producing numbers or charts that some people will understand, some people will not, but start to create spatial databases on where that is on the landscape. Um, and then you start to get a lot more information about uh, that can be used for restoration or at least uh, understanding what areas are at risk and what areas are not. Um, we start to scale up this information because once it's put in a form that's uh, easily shared, um, either as a map or as uh, numbers and formats uh, that can contribute to larger databases, in our case, the Amazon region, um, there's a huge boom of uh, mining and mercury contamination across the Amazon. Um, so there are uh, a lot of initiatives to try to see not just this little part of the Amazon or even just or even Peru, but the entire Amazon basin. And then, of course, we can compare that with other areas like in Africa or Southeast Asia, where you find lots of mining. Um, this allows for people to connect the dots. And that's one of the major advantages of improving data systems. Um, one, uh, to be able to connect the people that are being affected with, uh, with um, initiatives to try to help that. So by doing essentially just producing data and communicating it in uh, a more effective manner with local partners, with uh, universities and the regional governments and everything, we're now getting researchers that are coming to help us uh, generate more information um, it, and, and also there's a lot more information I mean there's a lot more potential for collaborations between um, government officials and other governments so now the governments of uh, Colombia and Ecuador are, uh, are traveling to Peru to a certain extent to see how this is done um, there's an initiative uh, with uh, USAID uh, with uh, specialists in, in minors in uh, Colombia that will want to come that are planning to come to Peru to see how this works. Um, so there's again data is allow the generation of data and having data systems allow this information to travel and to, to do uh, much more use or good um, in a shorter amount of time. I'll, I'll uh, pass it to Dominique for his thoughts. Thank you so much, Luis, for all the explanation you gave. And <clears throat> dealing with the work we have done on mercury issues, I can say that we have two major things that have been done, especially the noticing of, the, of mercury pollution. And another thing was the measurement of mercury pollution. In terms of noticing, of constatation of the mercury pollution, that has been done through just the fact that we notice the aggression of hydros or aquatic system due to the use of mercury in different reverse banks at national levels. What we saw was the fact that even using the national, the existing maps, the existing hydrology maps at country level, it is quite difficult to have an idea of all the numerous water bodies we have where miners are traveling. We notice that the existing hydrological maps existing at country's level were different of what we saw in reality because these maps are very old and have not been updated. So we discovered new rivers or new water streams where miners were working and this new rivers and other water bodies where miners were working were also affected by mercury pollution, which was not released in the different maps. So through our work, it has been able to identify the new sites of 
mercury pollutions at country levels at country levels but why is it that is that because it is difficult for the different governments to have a complete census of artisanal miners why this lack of control of the miners population and especially the distribution the distribution of this population over the national territories is source of itinerancy of different artisanal miners and that makes it difficult for us to measure how much mercury we have in different water bodies or soil or emitted in the air the other thing we made was the, the measurement of mercury pollution. What has been possible for us to do since 2010 in Cote d'Ivoire was to use a mobile spectrophotometer, especially a Russian brand um, spectrophotometer to monitor mercury pollution in the air of the different ASDM sites and other sites we saw, we visited. What was it was just possible to measure the, the amount of mercury released in the atmosphere such day according to the quantities of mercury that was used, or and also according to the atmospheric condition. That makes us having an idea of the pollution according to the day and according to the working day or the numbers of miners working in such area. We cannot, and since that. The different areas were populated by miners for just a certain period, especially for the gold rush. It, it, we, we cannot say that the data we we are able to obtain such day will be the same in the coming three months, in the coming six months, since there is a dynamic of miners mobility in the in the whole countries. You will find some peak of mercury use at a certain day, a certain day, but this peak will not be the same if you come one week later or two weeks later, or if you move to another area. Based on that, it was quite difficult to say that this is how, that is the dynamic of mercury pollution in different countries. Just what, and even when we decided to continue to address the other environmental pathway, it was quite difficult for us to quantify the mercury in water and even in sediment because the quantity we have after during the dry season was quite different during the rainy season because of the movement in the waters and of waters and even of sediments in the different water parks. So that makes another gap to, to, to be filled because if you want to, to quantify mercury in the environment, for example, in different countries and especially in water bodies and in sed even in sediment, we need to be sure of, the season we need to define at which season we are going to work and also to see the portion of the rivers or where we are going to make our different measurements that's another gap to address because we need to have an an evidence of mercury pollution in this place but this problem was generated what for from our from our research we noticed that this kind Okay, it looks like um, Dominique's okay, video. Entering. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, your video um, cut out for a couple of seconds there. Okay, sorry, go sorry. ahead and com complete your, okay, complete was, your statement, I, please. I was saying that the, the major causes of the... Okay, um, Dominique. Yes. Let's, um, I'm gonna turn your video off and... Um, okay. okay, I'll turn it off and I'll continue. Okay, so the major causes is where yes, yeah. The, another major cause was the difficulty of government to trace mercury quantities used in this sector. This cause is also linked to another one, which is the non-application of regulations prohibiting the. Okay, my, my last sentence was the fact that there was a non-application of mercury of prohibiting regulation of mercury prohibiting regulation for use in ASGM, which is also due to the weak coordination of action. So all this kind of in coordination of or weak coordination could be the source of the difficult 
tracing of mercury use in ASGM. Okay. I'll stop for now. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Dominic. Um, so, so a few uh, key points there, I think, is that the the mercury um, contamination it's not a, a static one time um, piece of information from the environment. It's very dynamic. It changes based on the um, environment. It, it, the miners um, are moving around to different locations. Um, it also sounds like there's there's a need for um, more scalable, perhaps less expensive or more accessible ways in which to measure mercury in the environment. Um, I, I know, Luis, your, yeah, your techniques require, um, the, it requires a laboratory and expertise um, in you know, measuring um, mercury from the, the samples that you take. And, and, um, and Dominique, the uh, spectro, Photometer that you also mentioned too is, is I imagine, um, probably expensive and, and not easily accessible. Um, uh, do either of you want to, um, or any of you want to comment on 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 that re in that regard, on the equipment um, perhaps that is needed for measurement? Okay, I'll go ahead. On that question, it is for for today acquiring the different equipments necessary to monitor mercury in environment, in environment is something very costly because it's not, we have some mobile tools which are not too much expensive, but even when you say it's not too much expensive, it's just relative because you have to think about the capacity of the entity which wants to afford it if it's not for pure research and it's like for just for monitoring activities i don't think it will be necessary to invest about ten thousand us dollar or twenty thousand us dollars for which is something not easy to afford by even artisanal miners group or even for local laboratories in charge of environment management at country in some african countries because the priority of different governments is in other sectors like agriculture, health, education, and research. But when it's about developing different plans for the coming years in terms of perspective, it is important to acquire such investment. And I think that for that purpose, the cost is not enough. And we also have some single tools that could be used to just not to, to just quantify mercury emission or mercury we um, we have in some sediments. We have some specific which are not too much expensive, but for and that could be even local cooperatives, local group of miners can even afford this kind of equipment so that it will be easy for them to track their own the, their own level of mercury pollution or mercury contamination. So it depends on the context where we are. Some equipment okay. for fundamental research could be expensive, but the one for just base, baseline tests or rapid tests of mercury identification could be easily affordable for for the populations and okay. for our so local labs. We're getting a couple of, of follow-up questions to this. Um, and before we go on to another topic, um, so there's just a clarification here is that, are we saying that the least expensive mercury meters cost 10,000 US dollars? Um, Luis, Luis is shaking his head no. Okay, Luis, do you wanna address that? Here we go. Um, well, it kind of depends on what you need. Um, so there are uh, mercury meters are expensive. Uh, merc well, full mercury analyzers that you would use in the laboratory are quite expensive, and they need specialized uh, personnel to do this. Um, there are some cheaper, uh, less expensive instruments, uh, and it depends on what kind of mercury, because there are several types of mercury. Um, not only that, there are mercury in different mediums, ones that you would measure in um, biological matrices like, like fish and, and plants and some in air, some in water. Um, there are um, some 
quick tests uh, which are being developed uh, for mercury and water up to a certain sensitivity. So it depends on the data you need, it depends on your cases. But I would say in general, that's, you know, the challenge is the price, yes, but also it's the ability to generate the information. And I, I think it's important to, to distinguish between data, which is a, a reading, a measurement, or something like that, and information, which is something that people can understand, people can use for taking decisions. Uh, and sometimes the problem not is the data part, or, but it's the generation of information that's usable for a particular audience. So if I have a laboratory and I, I take a measurement of I don't know, mercury and fish, and then I may put it into a PowerPoint and then I show it to a government official or to a minor, can they understand that? Can, will, is that really information that they can use to change behavior, to change the way they do business, to do the way they do mining, avoid eating contaminated fish? That's, that's part of data, but it's a, it's a little point. People just think that if you have the data, then all kinds of magic will happen and then things will change overnight. We find that that, that, that really rarely happens. Um, so one, you know, I think for the, you know, talking about the, the grand challenge, one of the, the opportunities is to uh, develop technologies that reduce the price. Um, so for example, the holy grail is to have a mercury analyzer, a mercury meter, that can measure mercury in the biological uh, tissue, in soil and water uh, at a really low price. Simplifying it so you don't need a specialized person, a, a laboratory technician or a scientist to do it. And also a way to take that information and turn it into, I'm sorry, take that data and turn it into information that people can see and understand. Um, and that's really the magic. It's not the, it's not the, the, the measurement but it's the fact that you want that piece of information in the head of the person that's going to you know, change their behavior to reduce their risk or not release uh, that mercury. Um, so, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, opportunities for solution makers that you know, maybe they're not specialists in creating uh, an equipment, a, a machine, a gizmo, but maybe a way of taking data that is produced and then translating it into something that people can really use. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you. Thank you, Luis, for bringing that up. Um, James, I'm going to um, jump to you because I know that you wanted to uh, make a few points um, regarding um, data. So why don't, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. No, absolutely. I mean, this, this is it. It's being able to, to tell that story, really. And it's that power of the quantitative data alongside that qualitative data. Uh, and that's also something, you know, through Delve that we're really, really keen on um, and the 2020 report, which we're putting together now and which will be published around September, really tries to focus in on that. Um, and I think there's another couple of key words that have come out in the discussion that are worth highlighting and um, providing a quick example um, to help illustrate. Um, so like dynamic, context specific, uh, you know, this is what small scale mining is. Um, and so for those uh, people um, submitting applications, you know, considering how it's going to be scalable, uh, there will be you know, broad uh, replicability and scalability across different ASM sites, but there also needs to be some way to tailor them and take account of these context-specific dynamic nature of small-scale mining. So I think that's really key. And then um, in terms of mapping and, and equipment, uh, I think a good, good example again is, is, yeah, the power of mapping, and I'm a geographer first and foremost, uh, to tell those stories and help policymakers and communities understand what's going on and you know address some of these these issues so um a good example um is through the sustainable development of mining in rwanda uh, program which is a uk aid funded program that that i work on and which uh, pact uh, is also a partner on and i'll send you the link to this policy brief i've, I've put together based on one of the interventions so what we did as is, is a, is a market systems development program so more of a facilitator is we, we found a drone survey company that had never done any mine drone survey before. Um, we brought them to a partner small scale mine site. And in Rwanda, uh, the main minerals are the three Ts, tin, tungsten, tantalum, which go into all our electronic devices. Uh, we flew, the, the drone was flown over the mine site um, and it was mapping where there's uh, waste heaps and spoil heaps uh, and also the terrain. So Rwanda is exceptionally hilly. It's known as the land of a thousand hills. Um, now, alongside that, that, that flyover with the drones, um, we also took some geological samples of some of these waste heaps. Um, so small scale mining generally 
um, because of the uh, cover, uh, types of equipment that's being used. Uh, um, often recovery rates can be as low as 30 to 40 percent of, of the mineral. So a lot of that ends up, you know, on, in Rwanda's case, on, on hillsides. Uh, and then it's pretty rainy here as well. So when it rains, it all gets washed into the river systems, uh, you know, pollutes them, makes them turgid, makes them brown. Uh, this actually has an effect in Rwanda on the, um, the one of the major dams here, which supplies hydroelectric power. It's running at 20% efficiency because of this uh, sedimentation. Anyway, so we flew these drone surveys over the top, uh, did the geological sampling, and with that data, we we're able to find that and quantify there was about three million dollars worth of uh, 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 metals, minerals lying on hillsides, very steep hillsides, um, just in this mine site alone. Um, the, the, the technical experts working on this then took some historical data for the whole of, whole of Rwanda um, to look at um, recovery rates. So, so based on how much was being exported and produced, they could estimate you know, uh, how much was being left behind. And across a country in a, in a neutral scenario, there's, there's perhaps $3.6 billion uh, lying on, on hillsides across the country uh, or, or in, a, in a very positive scenario, $8.8 .8 billion. Um, so now with the dollar value uh, on that material that's on the hillside, you could potentially find an environmental reclamation company that has the skills and expertise to safely remove it because uh, it, it, it's pretty unstable. You know, it's from kind of pegmatites, it's very crumbly material. Um, so you wouldn't really want miners or encourage miners to go and reclaim it. So with that value, you can you know, hopefully find a, a technical expert a company that could go and uh, you know, remove that, clean up the environment and also you know, recover that mineral waste. Uh, making a profit and, and, and also using otherwise you know um, materials left on the hillsides and then that will be exported contribute to national development so yeah the key things here to point out is just having that quantitative and qualitative data to tell the story um, alongside one another and, and using you know equipment like drones in innovative ways and new ways to help unlock uh, and tell that story and unlock the power of, of artisanal domestic mining That's that's a really um, that's a really intriguing example here. Um, it, it, there was a I don't know if uh, Luis or Dominic you wanted to um, add anything to um, to what James said, but there there is a question um, in that's regarding Delve. Um, so it's and I'm, I'm not sure that it's been answered um, in the written form, but the question is that. Uh, he understands that anyone can use um, then can use the Delve platform, but I think the question is getting at um, for what purpose does for what purpose do people currently use it, and um, for what purpose do you hope that people will use the Delve platform um, going forward? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I think maybe this is coming out a little bit, but not so clearly in our discussions is, you know, where do you actually go to start finding some of this data uh, without having to either have a contact within a government ministry or know a very experienced academic or a very experienced uh, organization? Um, you know, and also not only that, where do you go to get credible information? If you do a Google search, you either don't find the information or you find almost too much information, perhaps not what you're looking for. So really it's meant to be the initial uh, starting point um, for people to access information on the sector. Um, actually, early on in the development of the platform, uh, there were different, uh, and, and Nathan Schneck, who's now the project manager, full-time project manager, previous project manager, now, now working full-time, um, you know, spent, spent some time kind of uh, scoping, you know, who is the platform for and, and divided out uh, different um, stakeholders, different groups. So anyone from, from government uh, who are perhaps looking to see what the mineral policy is in their neighboring country or some of the production, um, you know, if, if you're getting quite different amounts, say in the Great Lakes region of gold production between, I don't know, Uganda, Rwanda, DRC, for example, you might start to have some question marks about, you know, where's your gold going from your country and why are you not collecting the tax, perhaps? So that's one stakeholder group. Another one I think is a clear one is academics, um, students um, who, are, who are studying this subject in detail uh, and, you know, can upload their own reports and also find uh, new information. And then again, rather than having to go to all these different websites, uh, you know, uh, just just being able to come here and find that that information easily, quickly, uh, and, and knowing that it's got a level of, of credibility. I mean, just finding like Delve isn't the data police. Um, you know, a key part of the Delve platform is not say this is good data, this is bad data. 
but instead to just kind of make it transparent and accessible uh, and try and have it as complete as possible and then really identify the gaps and say as a community this is what we need to address to move things forward. I hope that helps uh, answer. Yes, thank, thank you, James. Uh, Luis, you wanted to um, say something regarding uh, machine learning and how that might be applied to um, information out there. That's right. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, so James actually mentioned uh, the use of machine learning or artificial intelligence to draw information out of existing uh, data sources. And in the case of that, of what my, James was talking about, was the uh, the massive amounts of data that goes into the DOE platform and others that are similar. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities for solution makers to use AI, machine learning, deep learning. There's lots of techniques and terms. Um, but what it does, it, it, it leverages the ability of algorithms. And for better or worse, we're all uh, now in the, in the age of algorithms where Facebook and Twitter and Google and everything kind of are tools that are used for uh, providing services uh, for our online lives. Uh, but we can use a lot of the tools that are being used by actors like Facebook and Google uh, to, to improve ASM, um, where we can start to use machine learning and natural language processing for pulling out information out of these huge databases of documents that are, as uh, was said before, in someone's computer or on someone's drive, uh, as long as it's publicly shared, it's searchable. Um, and that, again, to kind of to connects the dots. Uh, another aspect for this is uh, using machine learning for analyzing the tremendous amount of remote sensing uh, information that's coming online. So uh, right now, there is a, a massive amount of satellite images that are free online that are being provided to the public um, through government and websites. Um, the United States has several satellites that have free images. Of course, everyone's familiar with Google, with Google Map, Google Earth. Um, there are uh, small uh, companies that are creating small uh, satellites that are starting to provide daily coverage of the planet at a resolution of about three meters. So that means you can see when things happen in almost real time. But again, those are images. Now you're, you have data and you have to produce the information that you want. Um, at uh, Wake Forest University and at Cynthia, we're working together uh, with, with uh, the development of, agri of al algorithms that can process these data in real time to extract where artisanal mining is happening and the deforestation that may be occurring uh, and the erosion that goes into rivers that may have mercury in it. So that, um, you know, that is a, a work to take all this data and extract the information you need. And then, of course, the next step would put it in some sort of a map viewer and make it publicly accessible so then people can see it and act on it. Um, there are lots of uh, initiatives like this to um, allow kind of a democratization of, of data. Um, there are platforms for um, that use apps for documenting deforestation that you might see or health effects related to ASM that then get uploaded in a format uh, and mapped so people can see and this may be helpful for health officials or for authorities um, and for neighbors where they see what's happening, what's, what's going on. In many cities, people have this for, um, you know, reporting that there's a pothole or the light is not working in your street. We can use this kind of approach for ASM. Um, also, um, not, not just for the kind of the negative part of it, but using machine learning for uh, data for uh, value chains and economies. Um, you know, ASM is an important uh, way to earn money for many people, and we're talking about metals and gemstones. So having buyers be more aware of the conditions that the products were produced, so they have traceability. So when, you, when somebody wants to pay a premium for metals or gemstones that are produced responsibly, that there is data and information that supports and justifies the price that they're going to pay. Um, and that gets passed on to the consumer. That's, you know, 
data and knowledge is, in, is critical for having well-functioning uh, economies, especially um, when we have uh, the production so far away from the consumption. Uh, somebody in, in China buying a, a ring that's produced with responsibly mined gold or diamonds or some other gemstone needs to know that uh, how it was produced in South, Amer South America or South Africa uh, and, and so that, 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 that makes sense. So again, lots of ways for people to engage and develop solutions because uh, without that, it will be very hard to keep any initiative sustainable. Um, so we need data scientists, but we also need people that have knowledge on what the information is, what information is missing at that, at the, at any stage of that process, either in the field or in the kind of the middle of the process or the middle of the economy, and also the consumer. Is there a way for consumers to be more aware? Um, so it's not just a, an issue of uh, of having uh, all the work uh, in the in the area of production. There's a lot of uh, good that can be done with consumers because they essentially will fund the entire mechanism uh, for for funding mining uh, far far away. Okay. Thanks. Yes. yes, please go ahead, Dominic. We have a, a okay. few more minutes. Yes, I will just I, I I will be short this time, and I just wanted to say that for in terms of data. Uh, on artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence uh, um, tools to be used, we have taken into consideration the fact that some the dynamic character of mercury use or even pollution um, quantification in ASM sectors. So that's why we have some new tools that have been developed through the United Nations Environmental Program platforms like um, MAPEX, and even the Kobo collects that have been developed through UNITA. And these tools are used to give us accurate data or updated data on mercury use or even on ASM dynamics in different African countries where data were difficult to, to obtain in the past. And this has been because every uh, Minamata focal points are still reporting to UN environment and based on that, they're updating every three months or every six months, or at least once a year, the data on the different ASM sites we have in different countries. Thank you. Um, we have, I know we're getting at time, but we have one, um, one more question, a uh, comment here that I want to, um, to pose to the panelists and see if we have a couple of minutes um, to, to address it. So, so the question is that um, there's a little concern about the, um, about speaking about technology uh, too much in this discussion, but there are also, there's a lot of good things that technology can do, but we, we must also be cognizant that there, if we're really interested in knowing or changing the activities of miners, we have to start by understanding the miners. And I think that's a really key point. Um, I, I agree. So if we are uh, trying to be serious about attempts at behavioral and cultural changes, um, the, the question is, um, what are some of the ways that your team or that uh, people, others on this call, can collect um, and include qualitative data? Um, so this was initially posed to, to you, James, um, but I think it applies to um, all of the panelists. So James, do you want to take a, the first crack at that? And sure, we're, we're at time, but let's each spend a couple of minutes on this and then we'll wrap up. Thank you. Okay, I'm looking at the clock. Great. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely, I completely agree. I mean, um, I think we understand the local community dynamics in order to develop uh, evidence based policy, right? And, that, and that's the key of, of, of having the quantitative things around, you know, my particular personal research area has been around relationships and trust between different actors within uh, not just supply chains, but actually uh, uh, looking at them as networks, you know, social networks of people. Um, so, yeah, we, we must understand this um, in, in order to, to ensure that policy aligns with the dynamics on the ground. And that's why before, you know, ASM is dynamic, it's context specific, it involves lots of different actors, uh, and, it's, and it's key to, to understand that. Um, just quickly, in terms of uh, the team at, at Pact Minds to Market, so, so Delve itself does not uh, go out and, and collect data, 
and we're an open source uh, database uh, to, to provide an avenue for some of this data to come out. And we hope that works both, both ways as well and that communities can, can also access online and create their own profiles as well and upload their data. But in terms of PACT as a group, um, our Minds to Markets uh, program uh, only works in artisanal small scale mining and, and every single one of the projects we do uh, includes a baseline survey, uh, data, both quantitative and qualitative data to really understand what's going on and to see an, an impact change. Um, a good, really good example going back to traceability would be the International Tin Association's uh, Supply Chain Initiative which PACT implements uh, for about 10 years now and yeah we, we, we map the movement uh, of, of 3T minerals uh, throughout the Great Lakes region to ensure that, that uh, to provide due diligence uh, and highlight um, any and flag any issues of, of, of conflict or, or, or negative negative impacts. Um, so yeah, it's it's absolutely key to, to understand those uh, local local dynamics uh, and make sure to uh, you know local contextualities are are, are yeah understood at the national level. Um, at the final point I would just like to add is that um, you know there's this. Perhaps there's this belief that um, we know all this already, we have all this data. I mean, quite simply, compared to other sectors like agriculture, health, we don't have huge baseline data sets stretching back decades for artisanal small scale mining. It really has been left off the development agenda in so many ways, despite the fact it cuts across all 17 SDGs. So yeah, some of these basic numbers just don't exist uh, that one might assume um, you know, for, for other sectors. Um, and, and it's such a hidden activity, a lot of it's informal. Um, you know that that's that's one of the reasons and a good example finally is that um, the United Nations Development Program actually we're looking at uh, development minerals which is not uh, your high value gemstones gold etc but more like your sands your clays uh, your granites and uh, they did a baseline for the first time in, U in Uganda bearing in mind Uganda uh, and this is all artisanal small scale mining most of it through that baseline assessment they essentially uh, added so to speak 1.4 percent uh, to the GDP because they actually quantified the value of uh, small-scale miners uh, working in development minerals to the economy. Um, so yeah, we absolutely need uh, to fill these data gaps to understand the sector. Thanks. Thank you, James. Um, Luis, Dominic, you, do you want to maybe uh, one minute each um, to address this last point? Luis, you are on mute. Okay, now you're not. Where, where Luis was? Dominic, please go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you. The only thing I wanted to say is that, <clears throat> to, to, to summarize all what we have we, we have said today, it will be important for different countries or even for scientists to be sure that what they are going to, for, okay, what what they are going to to design or to develop for a research should be in line with on not only what they have been able to see using the different uh, existing tools or maybe electronic tools or yes electronic tools but the, the good thing is that they need to to be sure that for a specific area they want to work the electronic tools could be a source of prior information but they need to do to, to, to be physical measurement or even um, to, to, to be some research in prisons to be sure that what they have seen or what they have been able to 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 design for using the electronic tools are the same are matching with the reality they are facing with when they are in the field because most of the time we have been we, we, we have been able to use the different some electronic tools to, to have a prior information on maybe pollution or even environmental information in different regions. But in most of the case, the fact that we arrive in this place to make the physical measurement is also gave us another idea of what the, of what we are able to experiment using the electronic tools. Just to be just just to say that they, they need to confront the reality of the field through to what they have been able to quantify uh, to to obtain as a result using the electronic tools. That was what I uh, I wanted to highlight on, on this point. Okay, Thanks, well, Dominic. Luis, um, your final the, thoughts? 
final thoughts are well about qualitative data it's key uh, I totally agree just using technology to, to develop the information is is just one tool for essentially uh, developing the information and, or, and asking people you know, we're talking about talking with people understanding their realities understanding their narratives and transforming that into uh, you know using the tools that we've been talking about into something that can be actionable and scalable uh, many times the histories and, and discussions stay at a very local level just one degree of separation the person that listens to it so by transforming that quality of data into a form that can really change uh, entire systems regions go across the world uh, and benefit so many more people is is critical it's easy to do that now than it was before with a lot of the tools, methods, and, uh, and approaches that we see. Um, you know, a tweak can change uh, so many things. Uh, we see this with the microplastics in that video of the, uh, of the turtle with the uh, straw up its nose, unfortunately. But, you know, uh, it really was a story about someone on a boat with a turtle. Um, uh, we can take much of the information, whether it's uh, uh, a story of, uh, how they work, um, how people are affected, um, what opportunities one group did, and, uh, and, and make that data, that information, really change uh, an entire sector. And I hope that's it's, it's something that happens with the, with the uh, uh, artisanal mining grand challenge. Thanks, Luis. Um, I, you know, I really appreciate everyone um, staying a few minutes after um, the, the deadline for this webinar or you know the, the time frame for it. Um, thank you everyone online for engaging through the, the um, QA function. If you have remaining questions, um, please feel free to send them to us at Conservation X Labs. Um, if you send it to water, the email address of water at conservationxlabs.org. Uh, there are more um, on our team at um, at the organization who can answer your questions. And Amy just put the, the email address <laughs> in, the chat, in the chat function. Um, we will update our frequently asked questions on the website based on some of the um, questions that we perhaps um, didn't get a chance to answer. And also there's a number of links that the panelists um, shared in the chat function. Um, this is also recorded, and so we will share this video uh, for all to watch again or to have perhaps share with your colleagues who are also interested in applying to the competition. Um, thanks again for your time, and um, we really hope to see you all um, participate in the Artisanal Mining Grand Challenge, and thank you. Thank you, again for your interest. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, and bye again.